Good evening, everyone. My name is Barry Katzen. I'm the founder and chief medical executive of Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this evening's webinar on radiation protection for the interventionalists, an overview of the occupational hazards and solutions. This is a critically important topic that we all have to live with every day, and we hope you certainly find it of value. It's a great pleasure to welcome our faculty for this evening and to introduce you to Dr. Minas Makari, uh, Director of Scholarly Activity and Research, the Assistant Professor of Radiology in the Department of Radiology and Vascular and Interventional Radiology at the Ohio State University Wexner College of Medicine from Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Makari, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Katzen, and uh, thank you for this uh, uh, fantastic opportunity to uh, be part of this uh, panel and uh, uh, discuss this important topic. Thank you. Our next faculty member is uh, Dr. Jihad Mustafa uh, from the Advanced Cardiac and Vascular Centers for Amputation Prevention in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine at Michigan State University College of uh, Human Medicine in East Lansing, Lansing Michigan. And uh, welcome, Dr. Mustafa. Thank you, Dr. Katzen. It's really a pleasure to be part of this. And then our, our uh, third faculty member tonight, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Travis Snyder, who's the program director at HCA Mountain View Hospital Radiology Residency in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's assistant adjunct professor of radiology uh, and neuroradiology at Toro University in Henderson, Nevada. And um, he's part of Simon Med Radiologist Group in Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada. Welcome, Dr. Snyder. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. So tonight we're going to be discussing radiation protection for the interventionalists an overview of the occupational hazards and solutions, a really critical topic for all of us working in the endovascular field. Here are the disclosures for our faculty for this evening. Tonight's program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP company, and is provided through an educational grant from Worldwide Innovations and Technologies Incorporated. The learning objectives for tonight's webinar are to evaluate the history of radiation hazards in medicine and the effect of these hazards on interventionalists, to identify the various sources of radiation exposure in the lab and evaluate methods of protection, and to assess the appropriate situational dose of radiation and the measures that have been taken for dose reduction. To start, I'd like to provide a little bit of background uh, as, we, as we begin tonight's discussion. In the past several years, there's been rapid growth of image-guided procedures, particularly in the past couple of decades, most of which uses ionizing, ionizing radiation, some with extraordinary dose and exposure risk to patients and operators. Image-guided procedures are a leading source of radiation exposure to both patients and operating, operators. Interventional procedures have today required the medical staff to be positioned close to the source, sometimes in very short proximity and in distances no more than four to six feet. Acute exposure is typically within regulatory limits. In the early years of radiation protection, there were numerous attempts to try and uh, begin to protect people who work with radiation, the early radiologists essentially, um, who were just learning about both the benefits and the risk of radiation. But from the very beginnings, going back to Rankin, people recognized that this invisible source of energy could be, um, could be difficult and create injury. You can see in what was called um, these different ages of, uh, of uh, protection, the era of protection of the pioneers, the golden age of radiology, where its diagnostic power was really just being uh, um, discovered, the sort of golden age, what was considered the golden age of radiation protection. Uh, which in retrospect uh, probably um, probably were still in today, and what was called the modern era in this uh, in this uh, analysis at the end of the last century. And then the modern era is characterized by great growth and complexity in the medical application of X-rays, radioactivity, including nuclear sources, and new modalities. And there became intensified concern and regulation of all things radiological. So in this later era of the last century is when regulations really began to develop. In any event, there was not much uh, sense of uh, protection for the rest of the body other than the hands. 
it's interesting that the price of this protection device is three dollars uh, at that time in history. And so um, you can see in this next generation, the no hands approach, as it was talked about, was intended to get the hands out of the field of view, even though the operator was looking directly at the X-ray source uh, um, pre-fluoroscope and, and image intensifiers. And here you can see an example of that in, in the lack of knowledge of radiation as everybody was kind of working in the field, <clears throat> but the one individual is wearing something to protect him. We've sort of come a long way, but still have uh, a lot of challenges. Now we know radiation produces energy from a source to a point, and there are different types of energy uh, that we're gonna be talking about today, but the ones that we work most frequently out with image-guided therapy are high energy ionizing radiation. And one of the things they've learned is that this radiation can actually uh, um, damage DNA and the DNA damage in a cell can produce a variety of different types of things. Um, cells do have the ability to, uh, to repair their own mutations or radiation can actually kill cells as it's done in radiation therapy, producing an unviable cell. Now, radiation can have two principal types of effects. You're gonna hear more of this, the so-called deterministic effect, which is the direct injury effect and there's a threshold dose or a minimum dose by which this happens. And it can produce direct mechanical um, uh, effects such as cataracts, hair loss, skin changes, and other types of organ damage. Uh, and so-called stochastic effects, which occur as a random event. They don't occur in every patient. They don't occur in everybody who's exposed. Uh, and there's no necessarily threshold level of dose. And the probability, however, is proportional to the dose and whose severity is independent of the dose. So our probability of a stochastic effect goes up with dose, but the severity of it doesn't necessarily occur. And this is the main effect that leads to the linkage of cancer and radiation effects. Um, there are dose risk models. So we know that if you receive a higher dose, you increase the risk of both direct injury uh, and the stochastic effects, but they're not necessarily lim li uh, linear effects as you can see here demonstrated in this model. Sometimes the actual events uh, uh, change during the course of dose and over time. In the lower doses, um, we don't have much epidemiologic data as relate to dose effect, which is why it's shown as a dotted line. We know much more about long-term effects and long-term dose effect relationships, as you see here. Now I mentioned the direct uh, uh, deterministic effects and um, those of us working uh, in the uh, interventional image-guided uh, therapy began to see effects as we began to work longer in the fluoro x-ray dose environment. Some of the earliest ones were with cardiac catheterization, uh, um, as you see here in the images on the right. And uh, those of us that work in the vascular space began to see more reports of radiation with prolonged targeted dose to the skin without moving the image amplifier from things like stip, uh, uh, TIPS or uh, uh, jugular bypass, transjugular intrahepatic porticable shunts. Um, we know that these injuries can occur over a short period of time. You see on the image of the left and they can heal out to six months. And we know this from direct radiation therapy, but we've also seen this from uh, uh, prolonged exposure from cardiac cath, from TIPS and other types of things. We also know that the damage in the skin may come back as you see this and a two-year recurrence of a large skin lesion. Uh, so they don't always heal. And frequently these are called radiation uh, dermatitis and frequently they're mistaken for other types of uh, dermatitis unless they're seen by an expert who, who's, uh, who understands the effects of radiation long-term. Now it's important for all of us to understand risk, especially as we do more endovascular procedures and there have been some risks, uh, some risks uh, that have been brought up of concerns, including the risk of cancer, uh, intracranial neoplasms. I would say this has not been, uh, there have been some studies documented this, particularly at the uh, increased left-sided exposure, and that's led to increased uh, interest in protection of the head during interventional procedures, and of course, cataracts. Um, we started through an interventional radiology survey through JVIR-sponsored research and uh, studies showing the incidence of these particular type of cataracts that don't occur naturally and are felt to be the result of exposure. We've also, uh, radiation exposure, we've also seen 
uh, this uh, milestone paper in 2015, which seemed to show that there is a genetic telomere uh, fraction and, and uh, uh, changes that could be identified by vascular uh, uh, lab findings in the carotid artery circulation in patients who were working in the cardiac catheterization environment. And you'll hear more about these, but there was mounting evidence linking radiation exposure to a variety of healthcare effects, as I mentioned. Um, our predecessors in the early years of, uh, of radiology were certainly linked to thyroid cancer and uh, hematopoietic cancers, and many of the early pioneers in use of radiation for diagnosis uh, passed away from those uh, diseases. Now, we have to balance these risks against our need to see things better. And so it's important to understand that image quality is always purchased with the use of radiation costs and contrast media to get the kind of images that make it see. So we rely on our partners to be able to help us reduce dose and get the same image quality at reduced dose. Now, you're gonna hear more about units of measurement and those of you who are interested in managing radiation in your own environment are going to um, hear a somewhat confusing list of different uh, uh, measurement uh, uh, units, including REMS, which we used to use, which are radiation times of quality initiatives, sieverts, uh, the use of RADs, which are we ready to absorb dose, and gray, also we do absorb dose. So we shifted to what's being important is the number of RADs being, let's say, generated to absorb dose by the patient or by the operators as being really the more important units. We need to look at dose as energy per mass absorbed in very small volumes. And it's a little bit like when we look at pharmacologic, um, pharmacologic uh, dosing, it's, it's really what gets into the tissue that's really more important than the dose that goes in on the front end. Of course, they're linked, of course, but everybody's ability to metabolize this are different. We also know that the dose is different at different points in time when we're measuring X-ray dose and it's another reason why we all have to be speaking about the specific reference point and really focus on the dose mass uh, equation and what's happening actually in tissue. Um, there are other dose quantities that are now being used in public health and ways of standardizing equipment. Those of you that work in, uh, in, in areas where there are multiple labs are, are gonna wanna make sure that the dose uh, being emitted and the dose effective dose is all standardized and that that's checked uh, very carefully using effective dose and equivalent dose using uh, sieverts, um, uh, as well as understanding what the dose Kerman is. Uh, and that's measured, measuring the dose flux going towards the patient. So in conclusion, there's in recent years, we've seen significant growth in the use of x-ray for imaging and therapy in both inpatient and outpatient environments. These environments have different regulatory pathways, I might add, and different le uh, levels of actually documenting uh, dose. But nonetheless, for all of us working in these doses, in these x-ray dose environments, we have the obligation to our patients and to ourselves to really manage this very carefully. Radiation is invisible. That creates its own challenge to both patients and uh, operators, all of us. Early radiologists suffered clearly high rates of cancers in a variety of organized organ systems including thyroid, lymphatic, and hematopoietic systems. We're now seeing newer applications, including cataracts and uh, possibly uh, uh, central nervous system neoplasms. With the rapid growth of x-ray use for guiding these therapeutic procedures, which are increasingly important and require increasing time, physicians are again working close to the source for long periods of time, making the risk of radiation stochastic manifestations significant. These are things we don't see till end of the career or, or two thirds of the career types of things. And I expect we're gonna see as a result of what's happened in the past 20 years, changes occur as we move forward uh, and, and our current career uh, uh, interventionalists seeing things later in their own lives. Um, so that represents a, a brief um, overview of some factors that we're gonna be hearing more about moving forward. It's a pleasure for me now to reintroduce to you Dr. Travis Snyder, who's gonna to talk to us about radiation dose and operator exposure sources in more detail. Dr. Snyder. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. We're talking about radiation doses and operator uh, exposure sources. So just a, a brief history of the uh, allowed radiation dose. 
So the first uh, kind of uh, uh, citation came out here in 1913, where the German uh, Rontgen Society uh, provided the guidelines to reduce the dangers of radiation exposure to uh, medical workers. And, and that was also to, uh, to the radiologists were actually uh, dying from, uh, from, from these exposures. Now, in, in 1934, the International Commission on Radiological Protection um, kind of first established the dose here, a 0.2 R per day um, for exposures of people that worked in, in radiation. And then that was uh, reduced further by half in 1936. Uh, and then after World War II, the, the tolerance was, was uh, the doses uh, changed and it was decreased. And, um, and also there was some uh, discussion about the radiosensitive regions of the body. And then uh, after uh, 1958, the maximum dose was reduced further uh, to five uh, rem per year for occupational workers and uh, much less than that for members of the public. And that's actually remained the current policy um, until now. Um, however, in uh, 1977, the ICRP also introduces this term called as low as reasonably possible, uh, or ARLA. And um, that's, that's been sort of the, uh, the goal is to just reduce it to a minimum dose whenever you can. And a lot of radiologists actually dictate that under the technique uh, portion of the CT. And everyone works with their different groups to try to lower the dose as much as you, uh, as much as you can. So that's sort of the, uh, how this uh, came to be. Um, and and this is this is the uh, breakdown of, of what's sort of recommended and the annual occupational dose for adults as we mentioned it's uh, five thousand millirem per year and this is further broken down by the skin so the skin is 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 uh, well, the whole body is is uh, five thousand and the skin is uh, higher and then the extremity is higher and the lens of the eye as you heard Dr. Katzen uh, speak about cataracts uh, that's why the recommended dose is lower for the up, up for the eye. So how do we uh, know what your radiation exposure is? How do we measure it? How do we keep track of what that is and make sure that we're not being overly exposed and that we're meeting these minimum guidelines that, um, that we just talked about? So the main, re the main way to do that is the, the, the cemetery film badge. And there's different types here. There's TLDs, there's electronic uh, EPDs, and aluminum oxide-based uh, dosimeters. And um, we won't get into how those work, but those are those are the standard uh, people that work in radiation are uh, have those as a standard part of their almost a, as part of their uniform. And these are often checked and replaced uh, monthly, and they're documented. And then if the patient, if someone has a uh, higher exposure, then you know they investigate and see why did this patient was there a, was there an incident or was it just is that patient was there were they too busy? Um, do we need to lower that uh, operator's uh, exposure? So this is required by regulations. All radiation workers must wear these. Um, and this is what they look like over, over here on the, on the right of the screen. You can see how these badges look, and many of you have seen these before. Um, and uh, and the, the interesting thing is this real-time dosimetry, where you know, checking it once a month may not be optimal because you may not know you had an exposure until the end of the month. Or So these real-time dosimetries are, are sort of the wave of the future. And uh, they have them individually, and therefore uh, they also have them for entire rooms, so that the room can actually be be measured. And so that's probably going to be something in the future that uh, we're we're going to see. Uh, and this is this is how they're worn. So there's uh, typically two dosimetries, and one is placed at the collar. And you can see this little uh, man here on the on the right of the screen. He's got the uh, uh, sort of the collar one. And that's uh, placed uh, uh, over the apron. And then at the waist, there's one that's typically placed under the apron. And so if you have a problem, that'll let you know if you may have a problem with the, some of these aprons, you want to check them for holes, or if you're hanging them in a way that's crinkling them, they can begin to uh, have, have, have leaks. And so that's one of the purposes for that. Um, lead apron should be worn. Protective glasses should be worn, as we uh, discussed. Um, uh, thyroid collars, uh, some people wear protective uh, caps. Um, and then the, the dosimetries are also available on the, on, on the fingers, so you can see when you're close to the patient what your, uh, what, what, what your dose might be there. So a little bit about safety regulations. Uh, the FDA has regulations for fluoroscopy, which are national. And the air kerma, uh, which uh, was mentioned as, as the measurement of the radiation sort of in the air, if you want to think of it like that, is, is cannot exceed 88 uh, milligrade per minute. And now the operator can override that 
but the audible signal must be present so that they're aware that they're overriding that. Sometimes um, uh, uh, interventionalists um, may need to increase the dose, uh, and and so, but the, it's it's required that uh, the machines are required to have that. Um, uh, the equipment also must uh, display the cumulative exposure times, and radiologists and other and interventionalists uh, as well will put this often in their reports so that the patients know, so it's documented in the medical record how much exposure the patient got. And if you go over five minutes, it's required that there's going to be an audible sound that will come up to let you know. And and you know, sometimes uh, uh, operators or interventionalists will you know, complain about that beeping sound. We've probably have seen that, but it's there for a purpose, and that's to so that it's known that you're going significantly or you're, you're doing uh, quite a bit of radiation. And uh, there are other regulations regarding the X-ray two potentials and currents, uh, which are which are more technical, but those are also uh, regulated. Another requirement is to have this last image hold uh, button, and uh, this is a, a really helpful tool. Um, I use this in my practice. Uh, where you, instead of taking a, a x-ray of the patient, you can just save the screen. There's options to save videos. So you can videotape and save it all, as, 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 we, uh, as we know. And so it limits uh, uh, radiation. So that's a, a requirement. Now, there are other requirements, but those vary by state, and we won't get into those. Um, but there are some states have to have, have, uh, have different regulations that must be followed. There's also some very interesting papers by the American College of Radiology and the American College of Cardiology where they have white papers uh, with very prominent uh, uh, people who are specialized in this who have written guidelines and recommendations. And those are certainly worth uh, reading if, if you're uh, exposed or operating a lot of uh, radiation environment. So a little bit about some of what uh, patients might uh, hear about in the news and some of the lawsuits that have come from problems in radiation. Um, and uh, this article is in the New York Times, a little old, but it talked about x-rays and unshielded infants and the, the benefit of shielding the patients in areas where they're not being, where they're not having scanned. And, uh, and talks about how especially infants, where the younger the patient is, the, the worse uh, that the exposure is. Uh, everyone knows the risk of young females, especially. Um, you know, getting CT abdomen and pelvises um, and things like that. And so this was an article that talked about the need for shielding. And so this is sort of what it might look like. Here's a uh, very, very cute, of course, uh, little baby uh, in a CT scanner, and uh, the lower part of it has been shielded so that the, 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 go the gonadal region is not exposed uh, to radiation. I think that's uh, you know, very appropriate uh, to do. Not, it's not required. Not all centers do this, but I think it would be um, helpful to those uh, uh, patients or can be helpful. So here's a patient that is having a, a CT of the uh, ankle, and they're um, shielded. Um, with various uh, protective uh, gear to limit their radiation dose. Here's another patient also getting a, 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 a ankle CT, but this can be done for any part of the body, uh, whatever part is not in the scanner uh, or whatever is not of interest to the clinician, uh, could, could be covered to limit the patient's radiation um, exposure. And, this, and if you do it the, the correct way, you can actually have zero radiation dose to brain, eyes, thyroid, and ovaries, and other areas that are... Covered, and I think in the future this will become more uh, widespread um, as, as, as we uh, move forward, this sort of shielding the patients. So here's a, a few uh, a brief uh, stories of, of lawsuits which have resulted from uh, radiation uh, problems. Uh, this unfortunate uh, young kid, there's a picture of him on the uh, right of the screen here. Uh, he was a 23-year-old, uh, very young infant with a neck injury, and he was squirming around in the scanner uh, uh, and so they kept scanning over and over, and, and the radiologists were not apparently comfortable with the quality. They thought maybe there was a fracture, so they scanned over and over. The, the tech kept scanning them, and no one uh, really stopped to see how many. And he actually had 151 CT scans, just an absolutely incredible number, uh, because of lack of knowledge of, of, of radiation. And, um, and so he, he, there was a whole story behind this. But he, anyway, this poor uh, kid had radiation burns on his eyes and his face and, and chromosomal damage. So it, uh, this is what can happen if, if there's a lack of a knowledge about uh, radiation. Um, there's another uh, unfortunate incident that, that happened um, from in 206 patients, there were significant there were significant uh, problems in how the CT scanners were, were programmed um, that resulted in, in eight times the radiation dose to the patient. And this error began in February 2008, and it was error was found in 2009. 
And so, um, especially in the CT perfusion patients, which do a lot of, uh, which do repeated scans, their patients lost hair and they had burns and things. Um, and it was not a problem with the equipment. It was a problem in how the technologists were overriding some safety features uh, in, in, in a mistake. Um, there's a misunderstanding about the embedded default settings by the machine, and as a result, there was higher than expected radiation. So uh, according to the FDA was involved, and 269 patients um, at this particular center were injured in this way, and then, but this didn't happen there. It was also 37 uh, happened in, uh, in Burbank, and there was others in Alabama. So this is something that I think is, is, needs to be uh, watched for to ensure that patients are not, uh, are not injured in this way. Uh, here's another lawsuit where well, this was not by a patient. This was actually by the workers at a hospital. And what happened was they created a room that was used for scanning or for radiation procedures that did not, did not have the proper construction or the lead barriers. And so this was discovered and they found that, um, um, that these patients were, that, that the workers there at the hospital were repeatedly exposed to radiation. So um, knowledge of, of these, of these uh, types of uh, events um, can be helpful to prevent future. So this is a, a close to the end here. Um, this is just a kind of a busy slide, but it's more for reference um, as into how much patients are getting actually from each radiologic procedure. And over here on the left, you can see the uh, single posterior anterior study of the chest, which is sometimes used as a reference, is 0 0.2 uh, millisieverts. And so that was, if, if you want to use that as a standard, you can compare to some of these CT scans are 10 or, or um, even hundreds of times uh, more if you're looking at the CT. And the interventional procedures are also uh, quite high. Now, this is an older article. So this, these, the CT machines nowadays are, are, have improved as compared to this, and the, the, the dose is actually less. And there's many advances that are coming out that are reducing the CT dose. So uh, the, it, this is not really what the current, unless you have an older machine, is, but it's, it's a way to see uh, how much some of these patients are forgetting. For example, this a pelvic embolization is getting 600 millisieverts. And, uh, and, other, and, and so we can imply that operators that do these procedures um, or are by the patients when they're getting them are also going to have dose is similar. Or less than the patient, but, but, but uh, in scale to each other. So a few other things that can impact the providers on these radiation on the procedures. Uh, BMI uh, is associated. So heavier patients um, uh, was associated. This was a study here um, by Matter, um, which showed a seven-fold increase in position radiation doses uh, compared with uh, smaller BMI. And it actually, interestingly, differed depending on which procedure was done, um, um, probably based on, on how the cameras were and, and how much was, was uh, focal versus uh, more detailed um, um, radiologic uh, images. Here's another interesting article uh, which, which talked about how the C-arm angulation can have an impact on providers. So depending on how the, how the, how the C-arm was rotated, it increases the, um, the dose to the providers. And also interestingly, the operator height uh, can also affect the dose if they're closer to the patient or closer to the, um, to the camera. So uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Snyder. And up next, we have Dr. McCary, who's going to discuss what measures have been taken for dose reduction. Dr. McCary. Thanks, Dr. Katzen, and uh, really appreciate the invitation to uh, speak on this important topic. And I'll be focusing on the um, uh, measures for uh, radiation uh, re dose reduction. So uh, my outline here, first I'm going to briefly touch up on the uh, radiation health effects and this is like why we're focused on this topic to begin with. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, four practical measures that we can uh, adopt to reduce the operator's dose. So um, pulse rate um, or frame rate, the image intensifier, intensifier position, the II position, the uh, time distance shielding, uh, this is the gold standard mantra for radiation safety. And then uh, some individual uh, protection measures for the operators. So uh, first, uh, radiation risks. And um, this is a summary from uh, multiple studies that have been done in the literature throughout the past uh, two decades primarily. And uh, it goes through the serious health effects that can happen from radiation. So uh, brain cancers, as uh, Dr. Katzen has alluded to earlier, 
And uh, those studies have been showing an increased incidence of uh, brain cancers, particularly left-sided brain cancers, and uh, even more interestingly, uh, radiosensitive tumors. So there is a significant correlation with radiation. Uh, additional malignancies include uh, skin cancers, thyroid cancers, head and neck, breast hematologic cancers, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma, have been associated with uh, radiation operators. Um, uh, interestingly, so traditionally, uh, the main focus is on cancer, but uh, vascular health also is uh, affected by radiation. So uh, op uh, radiation operators have increased uh, risk of strokes and uh, atherosclerotic disease, particularly the carotids. Um, another inter interesting uh, concept is um, leukocyte and endothelial cell uh, telomere length shortening, uh, which is basically a, a, uh, a measure of um, accelerated uh, biological aging. Uh, so uh, as we get older, our uh, telomeres shorten on their own, and uh, operators who work in radiation uh, they're telling me it's actually shorter uh, at a uh, fast and accelerated rate compared to controls of the same age. And new developments have also shown uh, increased chronic inflammation and inflammatory cytokines, um, increased hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. So that's just with radiation exposure, you can have a correlation with that. Uh, cataracts, and again, uh, this is a unique type of cataracts. It's not the uh, regular cataracts that uh, uh, you know, usually people get with aging. This is a, a posterior, this is a cataract that starts in the posterior part of the lengths, and it's a very uh, characteristic way uh, um, finding, and it starts, it's very um, correlated, highly correlated with radiation. Uh, another area that I found very interesting also is um, its effect on our mental capacity, so decreased memory, particularly visuospatial memory. Uh, verbal fluency, so harder to um, remember specific words for different uh, descriptors and things like that. There have been also uh, studies showing, um, you know, psychological effects as well, like depression and, and things like that. And then lastly, uh, chromosomal abnormalities and DNA breaks, as we've all uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, our bodies have the mechanisms to correct that, but also uh, multiple studies, for example, there's a recent study that was done in uh, va uh, vascular surgeons that do EVARs and OR, and they looked at the peripheral leukocytes because even if you wear lead, your arms and your hands may still be get exposed to close to the radiation, uh, and you know your lower legs, for example, as well. And they uh, measured, um, you know, the amount of DNA breaks that they had con uh, control uh, comparison to controls of the same age and they found a statistically significant uh, uh, DNA damage. So uh, there is a variety of, of um, injuries and risks that can uh, happen from radiation. And uh, the seriousness of this issue is that it's, uh, as we all know, tasteless. Um, uh, you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. And the effects happen even years down the road. So it's very easy to get complacent. And this is why uh, I'm going to be touching up on what things we can do in a day-to-day -day, um, uh, fashion to address these things. So uh, rad radiation uh, uh, reduction methods. And the first thing we're going to be addressing here is the pulse frame rate concept. Um, pulse frame rate, so basically this is the amount of radiation. It's uh, measured in pulse or frames per second. This is how much radiation is generated by the equipment. And uh, if we look here in this uh, diagram on the right side, if you are setting up your um, C arm where you have 15 pulses per second, you get all these pulses. And if you cut it down to 7.5, you basically have half of the pulses. Now, when you reduce the amount of pulses or frames, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. So you won't get necessarily 50% reduction because the equipment has a mechanism that um, to maintain the quality of the imaging, it would increase the amount of radiation per pulse. However, overall, there's still a, a reduction. And um, and these settings, you know, the standard of 30, which is con considered continuous fluoroscopy, and then you can go down to 15, 7.5, 5, 3, 2, 1. And they're usually automatic settings and there are defaults, but you can set them uh, manually at the user level. And at the end of the day, it's a balance between image quality and lag. So the slower you go, the image is going to be choppy and you might lose temporal or spatial resolution. But also, um, 
you know, you have less dose. So it, it's the balance between that. And as uh, Dr. Snyder alluded to, the mantra here is low is reasonably uh, achievable or Alara. So uh, what we're trying to do here is get uh, the lowest amount of radiation we need to get the job done. And um, basically, uh, most vendors have uh, varying levels of radiation. There's high settings and there's low settings. And uh, what operators should strive to do is set the default as the lowest that they can work with. And if there's a case where uh, they might need extra radiation or they need uh, it's, it's, it's helpful for the procedure, they can always uh, go up from there. But having that uh, set as the default will set a culture of um, radiation safety uh, for, for most of the operators in the department, for example. The uh, second concept here is the image uh, intensifier position, uh, the II position. And this is a very, very easy thing that uh, we could pay attention to and it would have a huge impact. Um, there is three panels here with three diagrams and panel A here is the ideal location of uh, the radiation um, of the II um, and the, the operator and the patient. And uh, basically uh, you want to increase the source to um, image intensifier distance, this distance. So we're going to raise the table as high as reasonably comfortable and then also lower the II uh, as much as possible so it's closest to the patient. And when you do that, it's a win-win because not only you uh, reduce your dose, but also you get the uh, lowest exposure and scatter and therefore the best uh, image quality that you can get. So it's better for imaging and it's also better for your dose. Um, and in this example, they have, you know, in this setting, it's one, uh, one dose units. In this example, um, they lower the II so it's closest to the patient. However, the uh, source to intensify distance uh, is, is very short, uh, very small. So the table is low and uh, the dose went from 1 to 1.4. Um, so it is a little bit higher here. And sometimes you can control that, you know, shorter operator and things like that. And, and um, some people even recommend having a, you know, if the operator is, is a shorter person, they can have a step stool or something they can stand, step up that can stand on during the case if it's a long case and that can reduce their dose. Uh, so that's one option here. Panel C is actually the worst thing ever, which is um, increasing the distance between the II and, and the patient. And when you do that, you, know, you can see it's 2.6. Uh, so not only this is high, uh, but also the table is low. And that's what we should try to, to avoid. So by simply just having the proper table positioning and being cognizant of um, where the II is the relationship to the patient, you can reduce your dose in a practical fashion uh, day to day. The next slide here, um, this is the, you know, the golden rule is what I call the golden rule of radiation safety is the time, distance, shielding concept. And very easy, very basic, and it's a huge, 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 huge thing that we can do. So it goes like this, you know, the less time and the more distance and shielding, the less dose. So, uh, and here I'm gonna talk about the time. So the time that we're talking about, the flora time is basically the, uh, our goal is to minimize the beam on time. So avoiding uh, what I call the uh, 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 left foot syndrome, uh, where, you know, the operator is uh, using flora continuously without uh, uh, intermittent fluoroscopy. So intermittent fluoroscopy should be our uh, practice where, you know, we tap as, as long as we need, but we were not continuously uh, generating radiation as much as possible. The other concept that also was alluded to before is the last image hold. So if you, there's a finding that you just saw and you want to look at it again with this function and it's regulatory mandated in equipment, uh, you can uh, save that last image and look at it or repeat it or pull it up again as much as you need and rather than continuously getting new floras and new injections to um, see the findings. The other concept that I have here and um, we're trained as interventionists to to look at the pre-planning imaging and spend a lot of time on it to, to uh, plan for our procedures. But this is huge because uh, if you go in in a procedure and you're ready, if you previously had a CAT scan or MRI or abdomen CT or something that can give you some helpful anatomical um, information, going in the, in the procedure room, you have a game plan. You already know, you have a mental picture of the anatomy and uh, you have a game plan. So uh, it takes you less time to accomplish, to find out the information you need to get the procedure done 
uh, utilizing that information um, that you already have and you already know instead of you know relearning or exploring the anatomy from de novo again. Um, so that's very helpful. You know, utilizing uh, whatever information we have and maximizing our uh, planning capacity. So when we go in, it's showtime and we want to be in and out in a f safe and efficient manner uh, to get the job done. The next um, part of this uh, time uh, distance shielding mantra is distance. And uh, this is a, one of my favorite concepts because um, it's, it's, uh, it's low hanging fruit and uh, it's very high yield, right? And it's because it's managed by the inverse square law. And basically, you double the distance, you quarter the dose. So it's not one-to-one, -one, it's square. Uh, and it's huge benefit. So uh, there are limits, obviously, to how much we can step back. But if we have a catheter in the patient and it's a longer catheter and we don't have to stand close to the patient, we can, you know, stand, the operator can stand maybe further towards the feet. And just a small amount of distance. So instead of um, standing here, if you stand there, you, you can significantly reduce your dose. Um, and this is a 3D concept. So even when you're standing, uh, you know, your torso or the patient level uh, and below because of backscatter, you get the most dose, but your head thankfully gets a lower amount. So um, minim increasing your distance has a huge effect on your dose. The other uh, practical uh, bit of information that we can also utilize in this uh, to maximize this concept is if we're doing, um, you know, high dose, for example, digital subtraction and geography, and uh, we have access to an injector, we can always hook up the, um, ac the catheter to the injector or sheath and uh, step back. And you step back behind the shield, step back further in distance, or if you're doing an exposure, we can alert our staff or trainees or whoever in the room with us or assistants so they can step back. And all these uh, add up, especially in a long case or even repeated uh, procedures. So that's another um, very effective and easy thing to do uh, in building our radiation safety culture is the concept of distance. The next concept here is uh, shielding. And this is again, part of that ma mantra. And shielding, you know, is it's not as simple as wearing our lead and that's it. Um, shielding, there's a variety of shields. Uh, they have different uses. And if you really utilize all your shields, you can reduce your dose significantly. And the benefit of that is, um, is huge. And it, it, it's very easy to do. There may be a little bit of, you know, culture shift and if utilizing the equipment, maybe some uh, little bit of extra time setting these up, but um, they're very, very practical and very useful. And um, the first one I have here is the table shields. And in this diagram in the uh, left lower side of the slide here, um, we're talking about uh, the below uh, table shields. And these are important because backscatter is a huge um, source of radiation below the table. And having them in the right position, so for example, if the operator is standing here, let's say groin axis or working lower, and you're standing here and the shield is here, it's not gonna be as efficacious. So these shields usually slide and just making sure they're in the right place is significant. The above table side shield is also a very important thing to have as much as possible. Uh, because, um, you know, scatter from the patient can be blocked by this. And uh, these are, again, they slide and they're very easy to use and uh, to work with. Uh, this is a, 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 mount, um, a mountain side shield and these are mobile. And um, if the patient is laying here, you have their uh, below table shield, your, your side shield, and then you have your, your, your hanging shield here. And uh, you can move that uh, on top of the patient or between you and the patient. And with all these shields, you can significantly reduce your dose. Uh, a lot of these shields, they have a, a curved edge here where the operator can have a conduit to um, uh, work through them. And uh, they're very, very helpful uh, to reduce radiation. And then lastly, um, you know, I'm mounting or hanging shields. And uh, this is another example of these type of shields, and this is the zero gravity concept where you have a, a whole uh, bodysuit of, she of, of shields, and uh, they're hanging from, a, the fl from the ceiling or from a mounted side uh, of uh, mobile mounted arms. And the beauty of, of, of having these types of shields is that um, they're actually, you know, uh, have higher lead equivalency than the regular lead, which is only five, five or more. And um, 
they also have a clear um, uh, window here that you can look for from and unlike your lead glasses this is circumferential and again these are thicker uh, leads uh, providing higher level of safety and on top of that they're hanging through here so even with the extra protection and the heavier amount of lead uh, you don't have the musculoskeletal issues or strain in your back and neck. The downside is uh, capital costs and investments, but long term, uh, these are very effective ways and uh, have, have a good uh, case for them uh, for radiation protection. The uh, second part of the shielding that I want to talk about here is the uh, person protective uh, uh, equipment. And um, as we all know, classically, we have the aprons, thyroid shields, eyewear, caps, gowns, uh, caps, gloves. And uh, having these, uh, the aprons to be sized appropriately is key. And uh, not ap all aprons are created equal. So uh, having that knowledge of the amount of lead in them and what style, are they like the butcher style where the back is not there? Are they circumferential? And then if they are, are the two uh, uh, parts in the front, are they overlapping? And that would give you the five millimeter equivalency or each uh, side is five millimeters. And uh, the other ploy that we need to be aware of is uh, lighter lead is not better lead. And there's a lot of marketing about lighter lead. And we have to be very cautious about that because it may be as equally efficacious for, um, for lower radiation, but for high radiation, you do need a higher atomic um, uh, material and it's like lead and uh, the amount of lead that is in actual uh, apron is correlated with the level of protection at higher KVP. So it is a trade-off between um, musculoskeletal, you know, strain and, and, and health and also it's a trade-off between that and radiation. So just because it's lighter, uh, it doesn't mean uh, it's going to be as protective and we need to be aware of that. Thyroid shields, um, there's different sizes, so just having the uh, appropriately sized shield to uh, be protective. Eyewear is super important, and uh, not all eyewear is made the same. There's a lot of new eyewear where there's a side shield, and I would strongly recommend that because where the operator is standing, let's say on the right side of the patient, uh, most of the radiation is, is, is coming to the left side of their head, and having that there is very key. Caps, uh, sometimes there's been some con controversy around that. Some people think it helps and some people say it doesn't. They don't, they don't. but uh, overall there's some positive evidence that uh, caps are protective. Uh, gloves are also helpful as long as your hand is not under the beam because having anything, um, um, you know, lead or any uh, um, high density material under, uh, what it will do is it will, um, prompt the equipment to increase automatic brightness control would increase the dose. So it actually would be counterproductive. So you can wear them as long as you're not right under there. And then a personal dosiometry, like uh, Dr. Uh, Snyder mentioned is, is key. And this is an example of the basic one. Uh, I do like the uh, real time dosiometers because it gives you the feedback right there that you've had a higher dose and you can actually modify your approach or be more cognizant of the amount of dose in the case or at the end of the day rather than wait a month later and then recognize that you've had higher exposure before that. But one point that I do want to mention about the dosiometry that is very important is uh, we should not get complacent because the all of the new information, and it's not that new, it's actually been growing over time, is is about the effects of chronic low-dose radiation. So just because we don't meet the uh, you know, regulatory markers, it doesn't mean we're okay. In my personal opinion, uh, as close to zero, there's no, you know, as close to zero is what we should strive for as long as we get the job done. So just because your personal dosiometer does not say, you know, you've, you've peaked or you're, doesn't mean you're safe. It, the, all what it means is that you haven't met the regulatory requirement, but if you have the ability to even reduce your dose further, I would strongly recommend that because LRI is key and, um, as low as reasonably possible. Um, so I would not just go by that as a, as a marker. I would even strive to do better. Um, I have shielding here. The other thing that I really uh, uh, like to mention is the radiation attenuation drapes. Uh, so these drapes, uh, they're disposable. They are uh, sterile. They're light. You put them on the patient, uh, and there's different lead equivalencies. 
Uh, they're not all made the same. Some of them have uh, two uh, uh, materials like um, antimony and bismuth, so it would block high energy and low energy, so they're not all the same. But um, if you have a two uh, material, one that is, is a good one, uh, you can reduce your dose up to 80, 85% and even higher. So between the side shields, between your personal protective material, and then if you put one of these on, you can even reduce your dose beyond that by 80% or so. And that is huge. Uh, they're low cost, they're uh, again, a win-win situation. They really don't interfere with the workflow and very easy to handle. Um, one of the uh, most exciting things that I'm going to mention today is the promise of actual agents that we can use for protection. So actual medications that you can um, intake before a procedure or getting exposed to radiation and that can reduce your risk. So um, antioxidants have been shown uh, to reduce radiation exposure, uh, the harmful effects of radiation exposure and DNA damage if you take them before that exposure. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kieran Murphy actually has been a pioneer from uh, Toronto, Canada, and he's published uh, multiple uh, studies on this. And this is a key paper in 2017 in JVIR. It's a prospective controlled trial. And uh, basically uh, his team, you know, they gave subjects um, two grams of vitamin C or ascorbate, 1.2 grams of uh, N-acylcysteine or mucomist, and 600 milligrams of lipolic acid uh, and also um, 30 milligrams of beta carotene. And that concoction, they gave them to uh, subjects before getting uh, bone scans. And um, after the bone scans, they measured, uh, they looked at their uh, lymphocytes and they used 3D microscopy and other techniques to measure the amount of DNA damage uh, compared to controls. And they showed a significant reduction. So this is something that I think in the future is going to have a bigger role where in addition to our equipment, in addition to our shielding, in addition to our um, all the other measures that we we discussed, it's actually agents that you know prior to doing a procedure, prior to going to the lab, that we might uh, utilize to reduce our exposures or the effects of, uh, dam of DNA dam on DNA damage. So. Um, in summary, uh, we've went over the uh, radiation protection methods that users can utilize um, using the equipment, uh, using uh, shielding, using uh, the basic mantra of uh, uh, time, distance, and shielding, and then future uh, promising uh, treatments like um, the oral agents that we've mentioned. And here's my contact information and social media information is if any of the audience members have any questions. Uh, I'm easily accessible and would love to help in any way I can. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to discuss this topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Makari. And now it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Jihad Mustafa, who's going to be talking to us about protection through the years, resources for minimizing radiation exposure. Dr. Mustafa. Thank you, Dr. Katzen, and thank you for this great opportunity to be able to speak about a very important topic which is uh, protection through the years from radiation. It's uh, absolutely an important topic for all physicians that are involved uh, with exposure to radiation. I want to take you uh, into more of a, a personal protection um, gears. And uh, the reason um, I was giving this topic is because uh, we take some of the gear for granted and probably not wear uh, most of these uh, very valuable um, gears. So just looked at a few studies that were published over the years, and it's really intriguing to see the extreme value of what we have in front of us here, uh, such as the lead cap, the shoulder guard, the wrist guard, the shin guard, and the lead lens safety glasses. So instead of actually trying to get your pictures from online or somewhere, so we end up doing a little study here very quickly in preparation for this talk today. So uh, we wanted to see what would exposure to ionized radiation from X-ray system do to us um, on a daily basis. So uh, we went ahead and looked at the uh, cap, the lead cap, and then we did some research and uh, found a few articles. And it's really intriguing, actually, how much we undermine the amount of radiation that we get um, exposed to into our neck and head. And there's one uh, large study that looked at 15,000 uh, procedures 
that were done in three centers over a five year period of time. And in that period of time, they found that the head and neck area generally received about 20 to 30 millisieverts um, which, uh, per year, uh, which an average, average variation about, should be about two, two to four. So two to four millisieverts. So this study actually showed that a biodose equivalent below regulatory limits set at 150 millisieverts per year, uh, which was set to protect the lens, the eyes, which is in the head, you know, etc. And uh, in this study, it was really found that most physicians in, that were evaluated did not meet those numbers. So it's a great example here to show you that we should not undermine the gear that is provided to us to wear. Um, also, they found, uh, interestingly, that the behavior of the physician and, or physician in training did impact the amount of millisiever to receive, whether it went up or went down. Those that were compliant uh, had less millisievers. Those that are non-compliant had more millisievers. So, as you know, this is a cumulative dose effect over the years. So, you know, based on your career, you want to be compliant based on the study. And this was a five-year study. And it was mentioned earlier by my colleagues. They found that the left-sided exposure was much higher than the right-sided exposure. So wearing this gear here, especially the cap, the head cap and the shoulder protection, both add value in terms of protecting your body. Of course, everything in combination with everything else. Earlier today, our colleague discussed actually scattered radiation and exposure to the uh, lower extremities, as well as the wrists and the hands. And we, we tend, actually we do wear these, this is our own. We've been wearing them for a few years now. And, um, and the reason we did that because of the scattered radiation and some of the effect. The benefit of this is extremely valuable and you wear it to the point to where your uh, skirt, uh, skirt ends. Um, it protects uh, valuable bone marrow area and uh, easy to put on, easy to take off. This was very intriguing um, to look at a couple of studies that were published and we wanted to see um, the myth of wearing regular glasses versus actually wearing a leather glass, glasses. So probably many of you have heard at one point in your career that wearing regular glasses is better than not wearing anything. That is true. But wearing re regular gra glasses is not equivalent to wearing leather gra glasses. So this is our own pictures. Uh, put them both under radiation, take a picture of them. And you can see the difference here. I don't have to explain it to you. But what's more interesting is a, a big IC cataract study that was published in 2018 in Sky uh, Journal, which was really surprisingly uh, sad in a way because 40 uh, 7% of those that were evaluated in that study had developed some form of cataract. So, um, you know, before you know it, it's there. It's there. And, um, and then Sky actually ended up make, making a statement that uh, this is a serious consequences and uh, serious because not of the some form of early cataract, but because of the possible event or the cumulative effect of the radiation over time to get um, true cataract. So um, you can see this picture here speaks volume to the value of wearing your glasses. I still have mine on, but um, definitely uh, recommend that you do so. This was discussed in details earlier. I won't go too much into it, um, but definitely, definitely uh, support the disposable shields. Uh, this is a phenomenal uh, uh, tools to use, uh, especially when we do CLI work. We need to protect ourselves as much as possible from scattered radiations. So um, if you can reinforce anything and support uh, your field and protect your field, um, the better off um, everyone is in the room. So again, we did a little bit of homework and um, look at how much reduction um, we can get. So every time you add any sort of scattered radiation reduction is a, is a global cumulative benefit for the entire staff in the room. 
And there's a couple of studies were done on this, and uh, actually one study that had a large number of patients was published in 2017 in Jack. And in that study, uh, the reduction in, in terms of exposure for the staff in the room in general, when they looked at um, 764 consecutive procedures, uh, so they found that those that followed the shielding that was discussed earlier, so we're strict in terms of following it versus 363 that didn't follow the shielding. And actually the, uh, the, the shielding associate was associated with nearly two third reduction in radiation exposure. So it's something that is not to be taken lightly. Uh, that's a significant reduction. And we all should be extremely um, connected to these guide deadlines in terms of uh, be um, compliant in using a protection, uh, shielding protection. In that study also, they published the uh, effective dose, um, normal, normalized dose area of products, which we call it EDAP. Um, and they found that EDAP shielding was reduced per person in the room in that study uh, from 1.1 0.5, those that were about um, six feet away from the source of radiation and was reduced for, uh, those that are closer was reduced from 2.4 to one um, millisievers. So the, the reduction is so significant uh, that actually this study was further evaluated and actually became a multi-society uh, expert, expert consensus paper came out of it and there's a document right now out there for, for clinicians that need some guidance in terms of why you need to use shielding. Again, uh, it was mentioned today in, this, in one of the, the talks, uh, the value of protecting your hands and your bones, etc. And Dr. Katzen alluded to that early on today. Uh, we take it very seriously. So if we have to use, um, for some reason, we have to have our hands under the x-ray for some reason, we definitely use the, uh, a leaded gloves. So this is our own image. Again, put in regular non leaded gloves versus leaded gloves. And the difference is tremendous. And um, uh, definitely the value over time is going to be uh, absolutely positive because of the cumulative effect of radiation exposure. Um, so this is another great example of being compliant and use the tools that are available to you. And there's obviously the excuse of it doesn't, it's not the same or you can't feel the same, but you gotta think about your health first your patients and your staff and do the right thing. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa, for that uh, great real world uh, demonstration of what you're doing in your own facility for protection. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting, we, we, we've seen a, a whole summary of different types of uh, dangers of radiation, how we're all trying to uh, advocate protection. Um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, perhaps each of you might be able to share if there's a single thing that you've done to reduce radiation exposure in your own section, your own department, what would you say is the most important thing? And perhaps I might start with Dr. Snyder. And um, all of you, I assume, are going to be responsible for radiation management and uh, and uh, quality improvement related to that. So, if uh, if you had one piece of advice to give everyone, uh, where would you start if you wanted to reduce radiation in your own environment? Well, and uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Katzen. So, uh, yeah, I think the the uh, for a as a, from an interventional perspective, um, I think wearing the glasses is is helpful. And sometimes with the you know with the recent virus and COVID, um, I find my glasses sometimes fog up, and so I have to adjust my mask to help it. But I think the cataracts, as you mentioned and others mentioned, is really a, a big area where I see a lot of interventionalists that, that don't use it. It's very simple just to have some glasses right in the room and you just put them on, but it's amazing how many people don't wear those glasses. So that'd be one. And uh, the second thing from a radiologist perspective is uh, not so much for the interventionist, but for the patients. Um, there's a lot of uh, procedures that are, or scans or protocols that are repetitive. Um, for example, uh, optimizing the protocols for each uh, patient. We, there's, there's sometimes the patient was scanned the day before and they, uh, the, the text will just do it again. Um, for this angiogram, sometimes they will do a non-contrast, sometimes text will do a non-contrast or it'll be in the protocol for the 
company or the hospital that if you have a certain procedure that all these scans are done. And, and sometimes it's too many scans for the patients. It's, some, it's a lot, most, many times it's not even helpful to do those extra scans or sometimes even confusing. And so I think if the if radiologist or, or other practitioners as well can tailor the CT examinations um, to look right at the area of concern and uh, do it in the most effective way without uh, superfluous uh, protocols or scans, I think would be, would be helpful. Uh, thank you, thank you for, for those comments. Uh, Dr. Makari? Um, so the biggest thing I think that, um, in my experience, the, big, the hardest challenge that we need to address is, you know, the culture of safety. So in my institution, you know, we had a lot of equipment, we have the shields, we had all this, the, all the different methods that we could use, but uh, they were not always as used. So having that uh, piece of education and then setting that culture, once you have the momentum going, uh, you know, some people may perceive it takes a little bit of time to set up the shield or maybe it's in the way it's not as convenient, but learning, you know, how to use it, where's the best place to position it, how, where you stand, and then having that momentum, I think, is key. And, um, you know, so now even my trainees, my, my fellows, my, my colleagues, uh, my technicians, my staff, they all know, you know, these are things that are important and they take the extra time to, to utilize them. And, um, and, and, and that's the biggest thing, just setting that culture and through education and promoting use of existing equipment. Leadership, leadership. Jihad? Um, you know, Dr. Kassim, really, uh, being independent, uh, you're responsible for a lot of people that work around you and yourself. So actually, we, we took that very seriously from day one. So safety, again, is extremely important. So what we did, uh, Dr. Kassim, looking at some of the trials and data out there, and we found that there's significant variation based on the behavior. So actually we went after behavior immediately. And from there we initiated policy and regulation. And from the policy and the regulation came out the implementation of them basically mandating that if you're gonna be in the uh, cat lab and be exposed to radiation, these are the gears that you have to wear, to wear. these are the shields that have to be in place. And uh, that created a serious culture in terms of the uh, radiation protection and everyone follows it. So, so knowing uh, that it's important to the chief uh, generally affects important to everyone else. Is that right? And that's what I'm hearing from, from you guys. Uh, yeah. It's kind of interesting because I think if we were to survey everybody who works in the interventional environment uh, in, at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute and ask them what your dose exposure was last month uh, or the last time you looked at what your exposure was, um, I, 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 I think it would be pretty safe to say not one person would actually know. Um, and I think um, for a lot of different reasons, obviously, uh, but I think one of the things we all have to do as leaders is make this a real important, uh, a real important issue for everybody, because when you have something that you can't see, you can't hear, you can't feel, and uh, everybody's focused on the patient, sometimes we don't really think enough about the operators and long-term career-based issues. Um, one of the things uh, I, I just wanted to mention is I think that... <clears throat> We talked a lot about radiation safety and all of us feel an obligation for the patients, for the staff in the room. We've heard each of you talk about not just concern about the operators, but also others in the room. And there are lots of simple things perhaps to the folks that are listening to this that you can do. I think just to mention one or two, um, one of the things we did at some point, we have a lot of suites at the Institute, is we just went around and, and took all the automatic uh, film, uh, filming sequences and went from three frames a second to two frames a second. We were talking about pulsing a fluoro, but we made it um, we made it an option to increase the frame rate rather than to decrease the frame rate. And I think by doing that, you, when you talk about mass reduction in radiation exposure, both to the operator, the patients, and whatever else, just making people think about things a little bit more is, is really important. Um, I think the, uh, the attention that we've uh, placed collectively on this and the importance for the future is, is uh, we all feel it's very important. And hopefully all of you uh, who are listening tonight will, uh, or whenever you're, all of you who are listening uh, will take away that message and go to your own institution and say, how can I possibly reduce radiation exposure for everyone involved, myself, the patient, uh, and everyone working in the environment in my own institution? Because there's great opportunities as you've all heard this evening. Real important steps are to protect everybody in the room from radiation exposure when you're working. 
um, it starts really by um, having those that are not working on, on the patient with us or involved directly to be back. So having the distance between us and them is important or away from the source of the radiation. Uh, that is one element. Wearing the protective gear is extremely important. And standing behind the shield, we have a big shield. Standing behind it when you're not doing anything uh, in, that has to do with the patient. You know, add the three of them together, uh, the Kelsey, we find that we protect our uh, team very well by doing that. So creating distance whenever possible between the source and anybody in the room that does not need to be near the source. Yes. So, uh, Dr. McCary, another real important thing you mentioned in your presentation was the issue of managing scatter. Uh, and that also relates to different body parts. All of us here do different kinds of procedures. And if you're working in the head and you're doing a, a neuro neurointerventionalist, you have certain risks. But if you're working in the liver and doing a biliary drainage, you have other, other things. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you, how you approach each case individually regarding managing scatter. No, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, the basic concept about scatter here is that, that we need to, um, you know, be aware of, especially in, in larger patients, as Dr. Mustafa has mentioned, is uh, limiting the amount that is uh, coming back. So, a collimation is key. So, a collimating actually is a win-win situation because not only limits the scatter to you, but also that it optimizes the image. So, collimating and then also to positioning. So uh, for instance, uh, if you're uh, imaging an area that has a high scatter and let's say the tube is angulated and the tube is next to the operator, then the back scatter is gonna be very high to the operator. Uh, if you have an option of obliquing away where the tube is actually facing you, it's counterintuitive, but that would be another uh, trick that you could do. And then, um, especially when you're working in body work and limbs, for example, having those disposable uh, pads like the rat pads, for example, uh, those are key because those areas where shields might not be as uh, form-fitting or convenient, but having that would also reduce the dose. Okay, thank you for those comments. So I hope uh, these discussions and, uh, and uh, Q&A were valuable to everybody on this very important subject of reducing uh, radiation exposure to our patients and our operators and everyone in the room. Thank you all very much to our faculty and to all of you for your attention. Mm -hmm.